So, um, to give you guys a, a perspective, I think the title was rather long on the page. But what it really is, is uh, now that I think about it, it's a zero trust operating system. And uh, let's go further. So, a little bit about me. I um, Have anyone used DVNA, DAM Vulnerable Node.js application? Yeah, like I kind of wrote that and um, I've spoken at a few conferences. Um, I have run Open Web Foundation. I'm skipping through this for time. Then disclaimer, a lot of subjective opinions ahead. Right, so challenge them and be open. Then um, BeamOS is still very, very much under active development, and I won't be giving you, um, you know, something you can start using regarding an OS yet. But we do have a part of BeamOS which is the core of what uh, makes it secure being released today. So thank you, Nalikon, and everyone for being here, and thanks for helping me set up. Right. So, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, not again. Oh wait, I don't think there is an issue. So yeah, what is an operating system? Like, uh, just a few words. Anyone would like to share what comes to your mind when you hear what is an, an operating system? The? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll come to the next slide. So, uh, <laughs> and we'll address why. So, uh, to, to the most sensible thing that uh, made sense to me, it's a piece of software that runs, that lets you run other software on top of some hardware. Yeah, like um, different people have made it different way, open source, monolithic, blah, blah, blah. Now, uh, we'll revis revisit this though, right? But the question here that is maybe more interesting for all of us is why is it so hard to secure? Anyone would like to go again? Why is operating system so hard to secure? Complexity, people are stupid. <laughs> yeah, so root is too wide open. Like if you want to do anything in that in a Linux operating system or maybe others, you need some sort of administrative privileges and it's too open. So that's, you know, a big thing. Um, fundamentally, you guys sort of answered it, right? Because it's designed to trust. It's designed to trust users with being sensible and applications with being secure. Now, uh, there's also other aspects like uh, drivers and hardware that, you know, contribute to making the operating system work and those also can run into issues. But first, let's, I mean, we are addressing those two, but let's talk about Two critical uh, aspects that, you know, aren't so addressed well. And how do we not trust users, like you're making the operating system for a user? How do you not trust the user who are you going to serve the operating system to? And, um, you know, let's look at that. So, first problem was, um, you know, there was two aspects, right? Appli user and applications. So, let's look at applications first, right? If we run apps in a VM, then you do get some level of confinement, which is good. It's a sandboxing mechanism. And uh, there was supposed to be a demo, <laughs> but uh, you know what happened. But I'm not going to leave you high and dry there. There's going to be something I can show. Blog.openwpp.org. Yay. Um, yeah. So, what I really uh, maybe want to show here is, um, uh, has anyone heard of uh, Chromium OSs or Chrome OSs Cross VM? It's a, you know, really, really cool project uh, by the Google team that is basically like Kimu, but built entirely in Rust. So, you get the benefits, security benefits of uh, having a code base in Rust. And also a lot of performance benefits that I noticed. So what you're seeing here, uh, I'll just maybe zoom it in further. So, so what you're seeing here is uh, me trying to start Firefox inside a cross cross VM. And once it starts, it's kind of indistinguishable in terms of performance. 
like you can resize it you can play 4k videos on it you can do almost anything on it and the way it works is uh, it actually runs an x server inside and it run runs the application inside on an x server and then you just see the frame buffer being rendered in the window here so um, there is no you know like passing in an x server from the host into the container or virtual machine and you know it's it's as good as it gets uh, in terms of uh, isolating and still getting a video output and because we are using Vertio GPU we get to do even 3D acceleration you can run maybe games with low FPS but that's not the focus here the focus is you can run decent browsing and all sorts of general purpose applications pretty securely so we did this as a POC some time back and uh, because you know BeamOS is you know supposed to run everything in VMs, we wanted to figure this part out. Um, so it does things like resizing, clipboard, uh, um, you know, mouse inputs. I guess I've written about it. Ah, yeah, file pass through. So let's say you have a file in your computer. You want to be able to open it in your application. That might be a you know LibreOffice document or it could be a video. So you have the ability to, if you look at the top here, um, open a file from your host inside a VM through Vertio FS, which is like a, um, you know, like a layer where you can pass files from the host to the guest and that works seamlessly too. So if you just combine, you know, the graphical performance, the ability to open files and it kind of blends in and looks just like a normal window. If you built an operating system around this, then it could just, you know, replace opening applications directly on the host and open them all in VMs. And that could solve the trust issue with the application side. And uh, yeah, you can even run full blown desktop operating system. That is also possible. So that was, you know, uh, one aspect of the demo. The things I wanted to focus was you want, you were able to resize freely, clipboard access, it's built on Rust and uh, CrossVM still has some issues and uh, the tool we are releasing actually uses Kimu as well so that you can work around those issues and use something from today onwards. Um, you know, like audio, the CrossVM needs like a Chrome OS specific audio server to run. So audio is still an issue and mouse issues and whatever. So performance and usability wise, uh, CPU, you get pretty much identical performance, which is really cool. Like you can, uh, run almost any intensive uh, app on it and it'll run fine and you can give it as much RAM as you want and the best part is due to memory ballooning if your VM or the app isn't really using as much as RAM it will give it back to the host so you can still run like hundreds of apps I, I haven't tested how many but you can run a lot of apps and it'll be fine. And the memory overhead for these VMs came out to be somewhere around 10 to 15 MB if we optimized it well. So let's, what's the difference, right? If I run an app normally and I run it in cross VM, 10 to 15 MB of additional RAM uh, per, you know, and a lot of that actually 10 to 15 plus 15. So around 30 MB. Half of it comes from the GPU frame buffer itself, wherein we have to show the, you know, display inside in, into the host. So there is a memory reserved for that. And rest of the memory overhead comes from uh, running an XORG server or something inside and probably we could optimize that. Then uh, GPU performance, yes, you can't play AAA games in it yet. If you uh, actually do a GPU pass through, you can. And there are projects called Looking Glass that let you run games inside, you know, a VM like this, you just open and you can start playing games in Linux just like that. And that's also possible, but yeah, you need to pass through an entire GPU. Then faster load time. So one of the things that's possible is, let's say if you launch Firefox, it takes maybe two, three seconds for some people or maybe more. But given that these are running in VMs, with Kimo, what we were able to do was start Firefox, snapshot it, save to disk, and start it again. And what we noted, what I saw was like 0.12 seconds of load time. So this is like the fastest Firefox ever loaded on any system that I saw or not, not just Firefox, any app for that matter. So, you know, when you talk about performance, you can actually get better, you know, responsiveness uh, out of this without having so much trade trade offs in terms of overhead. Then, you know, we saw opening a video file. We were able to, you know, open files from the system. 
Uh, drag and drop support is still coming, but we did experiment with it. It's possible. Then, yeah, other apps like Zoom. Yeah, so you could, uh, in theory, containerize everything. Like, I'll get next into how this containerization works. But, um, yeah. So, um, how, what, what's at the core of all these apps, right? Like, in the end, we are still running a virtual machine. It needs a disk and it needs the app in the disk. So, how do we build this? So, there are multiple ways we figured out we could do this. We could use NixOS and generate, you know, an entire OS image with the app, which was what we wanted to do, but it was kind of complex. So, what we did was uh, write a Docker file, install all the things you need to run, you know, a display server, run i3 window manager on top of it because it doesn't have much to show so that you could just put the window there and run the app. That was pretty much what we did. And this Docker file, um, I could just glimpse over some of the section. So GUI environment and basics to get the VM uh, be able to show the app. Then um, here is where you install your packages. So here, if you were to, you know, change it to something like Mousepad or Jim or any other Linux package, in theory, you could actually run any Linux package. And if you see on top, it's from Ubuntu. So if you want to install a package that's on Alpine or somewhere else, you could do that as well. And Alpine, yeah. So uh, how many of you used Alpine? <laughs> yeah, like really cool, really secure, really minimal, but I, I tried using it and um, we were able to get maybe uh, if Firefox was 150 MB, in 250 MB we were able to get everything done, which was crazy. But like for that, the amount of packages I had to manually go select and install was just so much painful. So one of the things we are looking at is if, you know, people can contribute who are good with Alpine, then we can get these apps to sizes that are less than, you know, like, um, snap or flat packs and other stuff too. So yeah, um, install packages, start the console and once the console starts, i3vm starts and i3vm by default is set to start your app. So very simple, uh, and sort of kept it that way because we wanted more people to be able to come in and do stuff. Then, uh, how do we convert this Docker file that we defined our app in? into a disk image because um, last time you QNU doesn't take a Docker file. So we need to uh, build this Docker file into a tar file and then convert that tar file into a QCOW file. So you could do that. It's two, three commands and it's not like you can convert any Docker file to, you know, QCOW and it'll work. So part of uh, the software that was installed on top here deals with um, adding the necessary software to convert, you know, a Docker root FS into a bootable file system. So start the VM. Um, once cross VM is compiled, then uh, basically you give it the CPU RAM, disable sandbox because cross VM still doesn't like sandboxes. Then, um, no, we managed to get it working with enable too, but this is in case you guys want to try it. It's a lot of pain. Um, you can just choose what kind of GPU you want. There is even a way to get accelerated Vulkan. So if you are trying to play games and stuff in it, like you can get accelerated Vulkan, which might let you run games and configure networking, give the file system, which we just converted into QCOW, uh, make keyboard and mouse input work, then set the IP address and point the init file system, I mean init, uh, for the OS and give the kernel. So CrossVM just takes the kernel, the root FS, boot arguments, and other CrossVM specific configurations. And you started, you saw, you were able to see what happened there. And there's actually, um, you know, we don't start it like this. We wrap this, you know, CrossVM command in something called OpenOS VMM. It's in, on our GitHub. I'll show you towards the end, which uh, also adds a guest agent on top. Because the resize function that you saw was not inherent to CrossVM, we were able to do get that working through a guest agent and clipboard as well. So this is how you start the VM once it's done. Um, we are able to start the VM, I mean, run this with Chemo as well. Why did we have to go back to Chemo when the whole thing was CrossVM? Because 
CrossVM wasn't built for, you know, everyone to use in yet. Like, I mean, they are working on it. They are supportive enough, but, you know, they have their priorities. So, uh, with Kimo, everything works and it's quite seamless. Uh, so, that's something too. So, what about sandboxing, right? Like, now we just ran an app in a VM. Like, I mean, we could do that before with containers and sandboxes. So, um, some sandboxes like Firefox, inbuilt sandboxing. Firefox, Chrome have their inbuilt sandboxing, but uh, it's up to the application developer to support it and build it. And it could have bugs. Like, we've had zero days. Like, had anyone been at the bad side of a zero day? <laughs> or seen people at the bad side of a zero day? Because it reminds me, like, the previous talk, I know someone who lost, like, uh, crazy amounts of money because there was a targeted zero day attack on them, like, because they were rich. So these things happen too. And, um, you know, so not maybe the best. Fire jail and bubble wrap. Yeah, you can do it, uh, but you should do it. Users should do it. The whole point is to not trust the users. So, uh, yeah, so that's something that's possible too. And the recent uh, and probably the best so far. What? We, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's been happening for a while. Oh, that's what the laugh is for. Okay, <laughs> I got it. So, uh, Flatpak, Snap, and App Image. So, this is um, pretty much in the right direction because it takes the, um, you know, user having to do things or developer having to do things and puts it up in a packaging environment. So, the app packages or, you know, the community itself can make it uh, more secure, which is wonderful. But, again, some of the limitations still apply. If there is a zero day, there's a privilege escalation sort of scenario, you still you know, lose things. Um, there are other limitations as well, but yeah, like short of time. Then there is projects like X11 Docker and Crosstini. So these go a step further, lets you run the application itself in a VM, but renders it on the display manager of the host through, um, you know, like a proxy X server running on top of the real X server so that you can sandbox it and apply security controls on top of it which is really good too. Like, uh, you know, in fact, I was a user of X11 Docker and then I realized, yeah, maybe it could be more easier and straightforward to people, right? So, so is KVM and, you know, sandboxing the best thing? It, let, I mean, that's up to you to decide, but what I can say is bugs are still possible, but the attack surface is less. So, um, it's the attack surface is now limited to the KVM code base in the Linux, you know, kernel and like the source code uh, instead of the whole user space, everything and everything. Uh, then comes cross VM and Kimo source code, the next layer, I mean, surface, then what are your drivers that are running to support the emulated devices inside the cross VM? Because these what are your drivers also run a process on the host and they can be sandboxed as well. So sandboxing can be applied on top of this KVM's, you know, virtualization. So that's also a thing to note. And the guest agent code, you know, the uh, guest agent responsible for resizing and clipboard. So this is the attack surface compared to quite literally almost the entire Linux, uh, you know, source code when you use normal sandboxing. I mean, you could do limiting, uh, but this makes it a bit more easier and it is in the end lesser attack surface overall. So isn't it like Cubes OS, the, the comparison that I mentioned? Um, it, it is sort of, but there are some differences. So, um, Beam OS is also, you know, going to run, uh, devices in a dev VM, networking stack on top of it on NetVM. And you will have a AVVM for separate uh, audio mic webcam. And it will use pipe wire so that you can securely give it access from all the apps. So yes, it is containerizing the uh, underlying aspects as well. As well as there are more containers. But yeah, I'm not putting that up here. It will look too much. Then, But there are some key differences. Cubes OS uses Zen at the core. And... That might be a plus for some people because of, again, the code base reasons. But uh, Linux KVM gives a lot of advantages too. Like you get, you know, accelerated graphics with Vertio GPU, even Vulkan um, uh, acceleration or 
you can do a lot more things, right? It's it's much faster. Like I said, the cross VM which you saw could play 4K videos on 4K, but you can't do that in CubeSovers yet. And CubeSovers is aimed at experts in a sense. Like, um, how many of you tried using CubeSovers? <laughs> How many of you lasted for more than like a week? <laughs> a week? That's good. <laughs> so, uh, like what, I mean, I tried using CubeSovers. It was really a piece of art, in my opinion. It kind of gave the whole understanding of what's possible and everything. Uh, but yeah, it was a bit difficult for newcomers to adopt. And uh, I mean, even experienced Linux people to adopt. So yeah, that's an issue. But uh, it is mature and tested versus something like this, which is just yet being hopscotched and put together. So yeah, there are differences. But some of the other differences are like, I mean, the key difference here is one app per VM. In CubeSovers, you have domains. You could have like a personal domain, a banking domain, a disposable domain, etc. And then you can have multiple apps on top of it. So it's like you have to create these domains, you have to install apps inside, you have to manage permissions. There's a lot of things to do. Um, it might work for some people better, but the thing is if one, ex one app in the domain gets exploited, you still can exploit the other apps and if the net domain has networking, then you can exfiltrate the data out of the domain. So that is probably um, okay because a lot of people use it in a way that such ca things can't happen, but it's still a possibility. But with uh, BeamOS, we aim to run everything inside a VM, even every single app. So even if an app gets exploited, it can only at best leak the, you know, app data. So that's that. Wow. <laughs> so cross-platform support. You could run Android apps, you could run Windows apps and Mac OS apps through these. We did experiment with these and they worked fine. Um, again, yet to be built into something very usable. Immutable file system. So, um, right now, um, uh, like NixOS, uh, how many of you are familiar with NixOS? Okay, then I'll uh, like go a little lower than that. So, um, you need to store apps, you need to store the core OS files, and these things don't really change. Only during runtime, certain things change. So what we managed to do was make the whole file system of the app immutable. So let's say you run an app, you close it and open it again. You don't get the changed file system. You are able to go back to the immutable file system. Why is this great? Because if an exploit did happen, the changes won't last if you close the app and restart. And during exploitation times, the apps crash. And if the apps crash, then, you know, when you reopen it, the exploit could run, but in this case, the file system is immutable, so it won't run. And, you know, there are some benefits to being immutable. Then declarative permissions, you can give app level permissions for what file system it can access, clipboard, whether it can automatically get clipboard or you have to do some special keys or no clipboard at all. What kind of audio, video, webcam, mic, can it do USB? I mean, you can just do crazy things for each app. And all of this is defined at the virtualization stack. So it's not like some other code that needs to be written. You can just tell CrossVM or Kimu not to give it and that's it. So that's good. Then workspaces. So the key issue um, with usability, one of the issue uh, I faced with CubesOS was the domains and you have to create multiple apps in domains and things like that. Here, given that every app runs in a VM, you could just have logical separations, like how you have workspaces in Ubuntu. Like you go down, it's a different workspace, and you can segregate these workspaces uh, with unique file system for personal use, for work use, and things like that. And you will still be able to do things between these workspaces. It's sort of like Cubes' domains, but again, every app runs in a VM, and it's more of a logical separation, so you get high performance window management stuff still going on. So you can run GNOME, KDE, whatever you want for each of these workspaces. And um, like you um, get better usability. So that's the focus here. Instead of one, you know, window manager where all the domains are coming there, which is kind of very clustered. So you can even run a gaming workspace with GPU pass through. Can the workspace by default is like a logical separation. So what I mean is it's a container. It's okay because the apps themselves still run in virtual machines, but
but it could just be a full blown vm like if you want to do some development and you're struggling just create a ubuntu vm make it a workspace and go ahead with your development and it just behaves like a normal vm but you also get the benefit of inter workspace features that other workspaces get which makes it even more usable then um, yeah i guess that's some of the points here remote rendering so all of the apps run in vm so the vms can run anywhere <laughs> like you could have a if you are a corporate you could have like centralized servers where all of these you know sense some of these sensitive apps might render and you can just remote it to the user that way the sensitive files need not even be at the user's computer i mean it's exactly the same as remote desktop but you can now do it at per app level so the user doesn't even feel the overhead of doing you know remote desktop and things like that and you could make an entire computer a thin client but still have better performance thanks to you know the window manager being locally rendered maybe that's one thing enterprise lockdown so yeah so this is crazy now um i'll come to this actually so uh, one of the points someone mentioned was you know as an admin user you could do a lot right the thing is admin user should be able to do everything but the problem is to do even something basic you need sudo and because you now need sudo for something basic you end up doing a lot of crazy things but with q i mean with uh, beam os what you are now able to do is uh, as an admin user you can do os installation workspace management you know define the security controls and things and set up monitoring do remote management of any aspect of the operating system if you permit it that is uh, but as a standard user you without sudo you still get to install and use apps you get to update you get to do backups you get encrypted workspaces where your sensitive files like you know in your personal workspace is encrypted and everything uh, needs to be authorized by the admin initially to be able to do this so that way you get full freedom to do whatever you are authorized to do and if you need something more if you are the person you know it's in your personal laptop then you can consciously use sudo only where necessary instead of just sudo sudo everywhere for random things right so this gives a lot more clarity on what is the sudo being used for and it provides that security why are we able to do this because apps run in vm so you can just download a qcop file start it in kimu without sudo privileges and you can you have an app updates and backups update the qcow image app up app updates or the tar file backups copy the mounted app folders where you know your firefox profile is things like that no need sudo for that as well encrypted workspaces store your app data and sensitive data on a um, you know some sort of crypt disk you know that way only you unlock it when you unlock the user or something so the admin need not even be able to see the user data but he can still remotely manage the security controls so and they can't be overridden because that part can only be done by the admin user and so these are some things that are you know i just wanted to answer that initially then yeah now that puts you into enterprise lockdowns given that the user is now only a user not sudo anymore their computer is partly theirs and partly yours now so you can run your local um, you know ids ips kind of there and have the, the user has no way to do anything on top of it especially if you do secure boot and other controls on top then um, applications files networks oh yeah so these three things together form a single rule so you can say firefox app can access only the downloads folder and it cannot access these 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 networks you can say another firefox instance because you can have multiple instances can access only the internal network but it cannot access any files so you can have a different browser for internal network and internal data and it has no access to files and you have a different browser for general browsing so this application file network combination rules are now possible that could lead to so much uh, control that the user can still do a lot of things but is still under you know a corporate's guidance of things then authentication revocation remotely uh, what's the time like am i running late seamless updates um yeah so you can update the base os without 
um, you know, like losing any of your app data because all of these apps run in VMs. You can just hibernate the apps, do the update, re resume the apps, and voila, like five seconds, ten seconds, if you're on a good system, and you just it's like closing your screen and opening. You have everything back on, and that's OS updates for you. Then uh, rollbacks are also possible because you can, you know, it's just files. You can switch back. Then powerful monitoring because everything happens in a VM bridged by middleware. You can easily look through what Vertio FS is exposing, what uh, the network uh, VM. So you have a net VM which sends the traffic, right? So you can see what network uh, connections are happening. You can look at the VM memory. You can do heuristics on top of you know the overall activity that's happening. These sort of monitoring was not possible because you know <laughs> even AV softwares were not able to do so far. So that's there. Yeah. So just because I feel like I'm rushing, let me check. Okay, I'm not sure what time it's supposed to end at, but I'll continue till three minutes. Okay. Can I have like five more minutes because we kind of had some issues? Five ten. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, um, how can I use it now? So you, you said Beam OS is under development, but the good news is, um, the ability to run virtual machines, I mean, applications in virtual machines is not something that can only be done in Beam OS. So I made a tool kind of in the past few days, um, because I realized we won't be able to lease the whole OS for the conference. So what this lets you do is, um, you know, I have to make the repository live. The plan was to release it from there. You could just uh, git clone a repository, this one, and you can just say vmpack build Firefox. It will build the Docker file image for the Firefox, and you can create a Firefox instance out of that image by doing vmpack install Firefox, Firefox, I mean, Fox1. So what this would let you do then is just show um, I didn't take a photo of that. So basically, like when you open your Windows key, you see a list of applications on your Linux. So just by running that vmpack install Firefox Fox 1 without any pseudo permissions, you now, I mean, just to add it to the uh, applications thing, you need pseudo, you will get Firefox on that. And when you open that, you will get seamless experience like you would normally have on, you know, normal operating systems. So I managed to pack in a few more apps like that. Firefox, Zoom, VLC to start with. And it literally just requires these commands and one other build command. So in four or five commands, you can start running Firefox, Signal, Telegram in VM, have clipboard, drag and drop, webcam, all of that stuff. So now this will let you actually, uh, you know, run CubeOS like experience on a normal Ubuntu or Debian based distro compatibility will be added to Mac and etc. So a uh, lot of things. Uh, yeah, so the you can have a custom kernel, you can have custom chemo options for each. The tool is very customizable. That's what I kind of tried to show it here. And you can harden this because you control what uh, the VM image you can basically remove um, sh bash and everything else at runtime once the app has started. So even if Firefox gets exploited, it doesn't even have a search or Python or anything to, you know, pivot further. So that is runtime hardening you can do and um, build time hardening you can, you know, might as well uninstall unused applications in the Docker build time. So, you know, like further reduce the attack surface. How is this more useful? It protects against privilege escalations in other zero days and much lower attack surface than any other sandbox. Um, next steps, yeah, next steps. <laughs> Git release, I will do that from my laptop so that you can actually use it. Then what did we see so far? Zero trust is possible. You can not trust the users and the applications and have an OS work while not limiting the user so much that he needs to you know, do sudo every time. Then a new kind of OS with possibilities and you just got a tool that you can start using to run apps in VMs. So with that, a concluding definition is, what is a zero trust OS? It lets you run any piece of software on top of a hardware. 
but in a secure and defined way, even when the user and additional software is not trustable, right? So I don't know if this term exists, but yeah. So how does this fit in open web? You know, where do you browse your web on? Like operating systems, like Linux or this thing. So open web has a bunch of plans to develop desktop OS, mobile OS, application services, box. A box is letting you self host seamlessly and a voice assistant and things like that. But all of these are pipe dreams so far, except the VM pack tool. So take it with a grain of salt. But if you would like to contribute, uh, there is a matrix channel or you could email me and I would really appreciate that. So I'm skipping the master plan. Um, yeah, feel free to contribute. Um, code is in github dot slash open W3B. And a fun note about W3B, Web3 is supposed to decentralize things, but uh, I don't think it's happening. But with this sort of a master plan, what you saw is make, um, you know, everything free, open source, self-hosted, federated, and friendly. You can actually decentralize the web. So, you know, that's something I wanted to add. Credits, Cubes OS, Spectrum OS. Uh, Spectrum OS is another project that's working on something very much the same. Uh, then, you know, a lot of people and especially Null and Nullcon, I basically got my first security um, meetup at Null community meetups. And one of the first conferences I attended was Nullcon. So all of this came because Nullcon was there. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I don't know if we have time for questions, but do we have questions? Maybe one? One question. Two? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, so normally, if you have like a classic, I don't know, hypervisor virtual box, it also comes with a big fat user space demon that is managing uh, pass through of devices, uh, host on the host, and all this kind of other stuff. I think you mentioned it, but um, and that's usually a big attack surface. So how do you secure? What are your plans to secure that in BeamOS this yeah. attack surface? So um, you're asking about the guest agent that runs inside the virtual box? No, the host, uh, the host, basically the services on the host that manage pass through of USB ah, the or drivers or yeah, file system and anything, clipboard, whatnot. Got it. So a um, few things you can do. So even cross VM runs, um, you know, for example, Virtio FSD to serve file system pass through and Virtio GPU to give that GPU acceleration. It does sandbox it as a Linux process. So in a sense, um, instead of the whole Linux ecosystem, you are limiting the attack to these things and you are sandboxing it. So that way, what you are end up, end up doing is just reducing the attack surface, but very significantly. Yeah, that's what the, does that answer the question? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well.